The year is 1137, and King Stephen of England is still trying to assert his authority, but the Welsh attacking in the west and a rebellious baron in the south has spent most of the royal treasury and has tied King Stephen up for three months, leading to further rebellions and questions over his kingship, as not every lord and baron accepted King Stephen enthusiastically as the manner in which he became king was controversial and some would argue the way he conducted his kingship was perhaps merciful or weak depending on how you would judge King Stephen's actions of sparing the rebels at Exeter, as his predecessor Henry I would have certainly made an example of the rebels. In early 1137, King Stephen sought to legitimise his kingship further and set sail for Normandy. This would be the first time setting foot in his French territories since his coronation. Of course, parts of Normandy were occupied by Empress Matilda, but she had little support to take over the whole of Normandy. In May, King Stephen met with Louis VI of France to discuss homage and other political arrangements. For King Louis, this was the perfect opportunity to sort any lingering issues between the Crown of England and France as King Louis was known as Louis the Fat, as the Asian king had been in poor health for years, so ensuring that his successor would have no issues with one of his most powerful vassals would be his top priority upon meeting King Stephen. The meeting went swimmingly, and King Stephen felt emboldened after meeting the French king, before returning to England in December 1137, but any feeling of normality was gone, as the truce King Stephen had signed with the King of Scots, David, had expired, and King David was now raiding the north of England. The deeds of Stephen describe King David's actions as inflamed by zeal for justice, both on account of ties of kinship and because he owed the woman the fealty he had promised, he determined to set the Kingdom of England in confusion. King Stephen once again used his organisational skills to rapidly deploy an army to head north and deal with the Scots. Campaigning early in the year 1138 was a risky business, as foraging in the winter would be difficult, and by February, King Stephen's army was marching through the area the Scots had sacked. But instead of finding the Scottish army, King Stephen's forces marched straight to Scotland and began pillaging around Lothian. These attacks began a game of tag between the two armies, as King David would march back to Scotland to attack King Stephen, but in return, King Stephen would avoid a pitched battle with the Scots before returning to England. King David's forces would continue raiding the north of England throughout March and April, as King Stephen was dealing with a rebellion in Hereford and by June, King David had a large enough army to attack the richer southern parts of England. York, one of the biggest cities in the north, would be the Scots' first target. The northern English barons were now truly afraid of this large Scottish army, as beforehand they were reluctant to work with each other as some were bitter rivals. But, with the Scottish threat approaching, they quickly abandoned any hesitation and united under one banner, the Banner of the Northern Church. With the Scots now rapidly approaching, the Archbishop of York, Turstin of Bayer, took control of the situation and rallied the Northern Shires, recruiting trained levies from Derby, Nottingham and parts of the Midlands. By June 1138, King David split his army in half and sent one army towards Lancaster under the command of William Fitz Duncan and the other to York. By the 10th of June, the Scots clashed with the English at the Battle of Clitheroe. Although the battle was a small-scale affair, the men of Galloway proved themselves against the English men-at-arms, who were equipped with halberds or chainmail. With one victory under their bouts, the Scots plundered and took what they could before heading towards York to join with King David again. By August, the Scots were near the town of Northallerton. The English were led by William Le Gros, Walter Esbeck, and Bernard Balliol, 
whom had been a vassal of King David, but for some reason renounced his oath to the King of Scots and joined the English. The sources don't elaborate any further on the reasons why he defected. The English army also brought with them a cart in the style of an Italian carroccio. The cart was described as a large cart with a large pole attached from a ship's mast and various flags from the northern churches. This is the first time this type of banner cart would appear in England and gives the battle its name, the Battle of the Standard. The cart would be used as a source of morale for the English and would give the presumption that God would be on the English side, something English chroniclers could use later as propaganda. The English and the Scots had quite different armies. The Scots had unique warriors such as the men of Galloway or Galwegians, men who fought in the ancient Celtic way of fighting with no armour or in some cases no clothes whatsoever, with only blue dye on their bodies and equipped with a spear and shield. The rest of the Scottish army was similar to the English, mounted Norman knights who would sometimes dismount and fight on foot, armoured men at arms and on the English side local levies and archers. Some of the English archers may have been equipped with longbows. There is no exact count of the number each side fielded. The monk Alred, one of the sources of this battle, only mentions that the Scots had a larger force. Modern estimates state that the English had 10,000 and the Scots 16,000 men. In the early hours of the 22nd of August 1138, the Scots arrived on the plains north of the town of Northallerton. A thick morning fog covered the area, obscuring each army's field of vision. Eventually, the Scots set their battle formation on a hill facing southwards. From there, they could see the English army already in formation, along with their standard on the other hill. The English line stretched across two miles long. Within the first line of the English army were dismounted knights and archers mixed in together, a tactic the English would use against numerous foes in the future. Before the battle, a speech was given by one of the English commanders. We don't know who as each source gives different names, but the speech that was recorded basically listed the accomplishments of the Normans and attacked the Scots character, culture and condemned their actions of sacking the north of England, which is quite ironic coming from the Normans. King David's battle plan was to use his heavy cavalry and infantry to smash the first English line and push forward using his greater numbers to apply maximum pressure and rout the English army. However, the Galwegians protested angrily that they should lead the first charge of battle as they had defeated the Normans at Clitheroe and it was their right to lead the charge. King David's Norman advisers countered the Galwegians' protest, which eventually led to an argument. King David stood between the two sides and shouted them down. He relented and allowed the Galwegians to be in the first battle line. With the matter settled, the battle was opened with the Galwegians charging towards the first English line at the base of the hill. The English archers then fired upon the Galwegians, who then fell in great numbers. And by the time they reached the English line, few of them remained, and they were easily defeated by the now advancing English infantry. The men of Lothian broke off from the fight after their leaders were killed, and one source describes the remaining Galwegians as hedgehogs with spines still fighting in a blind rage. Now realising his mistake, King David tried to fix the situation by ordering his knights to dismount to hold the line, while his son, the Prince Henry, gathered his knights and tried to flank the English. But the cavalry charge was resisted and then pushed back due to lack of support. The Scots were soon retreating but King David managed to organise a rear guard, which enabled the Scots to escape in an organised manner. The English did not pursue. The losses for the English were reported as low, while the Scots' losses were high, 
Although we don't have an exact figure, the bodies of the dead Scots were buried on the battlefield or near a lane called Scots Pit Lane, but there is an argument that the position of each army was completely different from the sources, as one hill is called the Standard Hill and the other the Red Hill, but until we have more archaeological evidence, we cannot accurately state which hill the English or the Scots were positioned on. King David retreated to Carlisle, where he regrouped. Despite this loss, King David still held a good portion of the north of England, and King Stephen was aware that King David was one, if not his biggest threat, as Empress Matilda was across the channel, whereas King David was on the same isle. So, King Stephen sought a permanent peace with the King of Scots. The Treaty of Durham gave the Scots control over parts of the north of England, but as English vassals subject to English laws. Despite the loss, the Battle of the Standard gained King David mostly what he wanted, and for King Stephen, the victory was the boost he needed to secure the loyalty of the northern barons. But once again, King Stephen's actions would create issues in the future for him.